Did my hair this morning. Hey, here today, God in Well, you know, we're sitting here with James Cuthbert. 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 Right. Practicing at home. James Cuthbert. So, uh, brand manager, what exactly does being a brand manager entail? Yeah, well, being a brand manager entails more than anything understanding of uh, consumers or just people in general. I always like to say if you're going to be a good brand manager, you're usually a good person or personable. You're somebody who cares a lot about knowing why people make the decisions they make. Exactly. Probably always been inquisitive. Like, why did you pick this bottle versus this bottle of shampoo, mom? Or, you know, why did we buy this brand of ketchup versus this one? Or why did you buy this soda versus this one? And for me, I've always been curious more so about products and somewhat what about products, but more so about people. And I think a good brand manager is somebody who's just curious about people and how they tick. Obey Your Verse, that was a major global campaign. Can you talk about that campaign a little bit? Before we talk about Obey Your Verse, let me take it back a little bit. So, okay. you know, starting with, uh, you know, I was actually working at Kellogg's at the time. This is kind of the middle of my career. Um, and I got a LinkedIn request for a job to run music marketing on Sprite. You know, me being somebody who has a long history in music, man, from being a DJ to help pay my way through college, to doing freestyle battles when I was younger, to someone who just grew up with in and around hip hop my whole life. Um, so as soon as I saw that, I went to my wife, who was nine months pregnant, and I said, you know, got this potential opportunity. It means moving, you know, driving all the way to Atlanta, but uh, I'd be doing music marketing. I think it'd be a good career move. My wife said, you know what? We're in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I could pack a box. Let's go. So I got on the road, and, and you know, I came into this, uh, this opportunity to really reshape Sprite music. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you remember the old campaigns for Sprite, the old Obey Your Thirst campaigns. Yes, yes. The classic ones in the 90s with uh, KRS One and MC Shan mm -hmm. in the ring, or Nas and AZ on the stoop, right. um, you know, uh, or to Tribe Called Quest, kind of like Cypher in the beginning, or the classic Pete Rock one in the studio. Um, I remember those. I was 13 when those first came out. So, like, my first, you know, as a teenager, uh, you know, aha moment in marketing was how come they get it? They're not supposed to just get, no, this culture is for us, this culture isn't for them, how do they get it? Exactly. Um, so for me it was like coming on, I was like, you know, I think I have an opportunity to bring that essence back. Of being kind of that, uh, being a true patron of the art form. Um, so with that, um, you know, I came to Sprite and uh, came up with this idea of like, man, what if we could do a couple things? One, what if we could be a true patron of the art form? And being a true patron in my eyes is, what if we could turn Sprite into what I call the Wheaties box of soft drinks? So I was working at General Mills before I was working at Kellogg's. So the idea that you could like, you know, Wheaties box was cool. I'm like, how do they make a cereal box cool? I was like, I think we can do better than that. Sprite is a little bit cooler than that. So then the idea was pretty much born of like, let's take artists, let's have them speak in their own words, mm -hmm. what the idea of being true to themselves means, which I think is more important now than it was even, you know, five, 10 years ago, especially in the art form that's kind of become so commoditized. How do you make sure that young people, as well as um, you know, uh, the artists that we deal with, are being the truest to themselves right. and truly obeying their thirst? Right. So that was kind of wow. impetus for obey your thirst. Right? Right. So for me, this, I had this idea of inspire and enable youth to be true to themselves, right? Yeah. So inspire is, I see Tupac's lyrics on a can, I see Rakim's lyrics on a can, I see Drake's lyrics on a can, Nas, uh, J. Cole, Missy, et cetera. That's gonna be inspiring, but it's not Rakim, yeah. but it's not tangible, right? Mm -hmm. So like, how do you bring that all the way down to, uh, to, to, to the street, right? So then the idea is like, how do we be, how do we truly enable them to be true to themselves? So we uh, met a gentleman, Dr. Williams, mm -hmm. from the Boys and Girls Club, he's the president of programming. Actually started one of the first hip hop scholarships and biggest hip hop scholarship in the country. Um, became one of my mentors, but we started talking about this idea of like, man, I think we could really help bring teens back in droves to the Boys and Girls Club if we gave them something cultural really to bite into that they love and they never had a hip-hop program before um, so we helped create um, and fund a program called lyricism 101 that would teach kids life and literary skills through hip-hop teach them how to cipher more importantly teaching them how to communicate their true authentic voice um, through a passion point they care about um, and if they, once they get to the Boys and Girls Club which is the largest youth serving organization in the country we know that more positive outcomes are, are in their future you know, and today that program's in 22 cities uh, across the country. Wow. So um, that's great. That's great. it's one of the biggest hip hop programs that's uh, with a, with a core research based curriculum there is. So what are some of your passions? Like what drives you? Oh man, um, when I think about my passions, I really think about three things. Um, the most important one to me is, is family and faith. Right? I think that keeps you grounded. Um, and even more importantly, kind of like going back to my community in Rochester, New York 
it's always important for me as a black man to be back there very visible in my community with my wife and with my children and talking about the successes I've been able to have, which I feel like I haven't even scratched the surface. I've got a ton more to do, um, you know, a lot more personal work to do, you know, in my career. Um, so you got, you got faith and family. The second thing that really drives me um, is finding a way to help in the community. Um, you know, there's some days where that looks like volunteering, there's some days where that looks like donating money, and there, there's some days it looks like just giving your time and sitting down with a young person one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you know, I, my career spans marketing as well as nonprofit, and uh, when, when I think about what really drives me, it's the, the family and faith, then you have this community, and then the last thing I say drives me is I'm never settled. I'm never, I've got, uh, you know, uh, people, you know, I'm West Indian too, so my dad's from Trinidad, so they say you're haunted, right? So I'm ha I, I can't sit still, so I, I, what's next, what's the next accomplishment? Um, you know, it's, I never feel comfortable. Um, and I always feel like there's a bigger opportunity to do more for myself and the community and the people that I care about. You talked about community, culture, and family being a big part of your life. Uh, and I understand you're doing some projects with your family. Can we discuss some of those projects? Oh, sure, yeah. My, my brother is, uh, he is probably got the most artistic skill in the entire family. Oh, okay. And it's not close. Um, it's funny, I played basketball, you know, I'm 6'1", he's 6'6", six, six and never played basketball. So I always like to say he stole my height. But he has all this creativity, right? So um, he started this documentary called The Coloring Book. And what it really spans for is, uh, and I'm biracial, so my father's from Trinidad, and uh, you know, and my mother is from, her family's originally from Wales, but from the country, oh, okay. from the country, think middle America, upstate New York country. Right. So you've got these two kind of like worlds colliding. Right. Um, and when, you know, this is, you know, they got married almost, almost close, closing on 50 years ago, so that when, you know, it was a lot harder to be biracial in, uh, in America right. 50 years ago versus, versus today. Um, so he wanted, really wanted to talk about his life and his, uh, his journey, um, as he discovered kind of, um, you know, what race really meant to him, how it impacted his life, how people would try to put you in a box um, and say, no, you're black or you're white, you get pretty much have to choose. Um, so I feel like that was the, you know, to me, um, him actually being able to take that, turn that into a documentary that could potentially help other people who are biracial or other people who just care about culture and care about the sensitivities within race and bringing some of those things to light, I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be awesome. And for me to be, be a part of that, my family to be a part of it as well, is really cool and satisfying. Based on what you know today and all that you've been through, what would the current James tell the 17-year-old James? That's a great question. Um, you know, growing up in Rochester, New York, um, and kind of growing up in the, in, the, in the inner city and public school system in Rochester, New York, with the, isn't the best public school system if you look it up. Um, I would tell him to, to dare to dream even further than you would imagine. Um, what I love about Atlanta, what I love about cities like uh, DC, um, is you get to see people that look like you in every field imaginable. Um, so growing up somewhere like Rochester, New York, it's, it's fairly segmented. You don't see a lot of black people that are uh, successful as you do in other cities in different fields, such as doctors and lawyers, et cetera. Um, so at that time, I didn't know how great I could be. Um, I would put a limit on how, what I can do. I didn't know what it would take to have a successful career. Right? Um, you know, so I would tell that kid, I would tell him to dream even further than he would imagine because you're never limited by your surroundings. Um, and more importantly, you never know what you can do. Um, and the whole world is open up to you. <laughs> I'm James Cuthbert, and you just took a journey with me, just beyond the spotlight. I'm just trying to give you like that's just some of the of who I am and kind of what I'm about.